Let me turn on the recording. This is the Generative Commons call on Wednesday, June 23rd, 2021. Um, good. Uh, let's just let's just dive in wherever. Um, I I will confess that I meant uh, I think we ended our last call saying let's invite a whole bunch of other people who belong in this call to this call, and I did no such thing. I I, I didn't invite anyone. I was, I was obsessed with trying to figure out how to pitch OGM to raise some funds for OGM fellowships. Um, well. But it's still something we should do. Uh, and, then I, and then I sort of mentioned this also <laughs> to, a, to a friend whose question to me was, are you sure this is a problem? Which I asked then on the, on the Mattermost chat for this. He's like, you know, is this an issue? And, and I, think it's, I think it's an important issue to sort of clarify how the ground rules for playing in these, in these sorts of projects are different from the typical ground rules of, over intellectual property and participation. Uh, but that said, uh, there's, no, there's no protest movement in the streets for people who are missing a, you know, a generative commons agreement, for example. There, there, there's all this activity on the P2P uh, foundation about people trying to define this because they realize it's a problem. Uh, David, as we know, is working hard on this because he sees it as a problem. Uh, I'm always amazed at how we connectors, how little we connectors are cooperating. Uh, and I'm trying to understand why. Part of it, of course, is there is a scarcity problem because not many people see the need for the work we're doing uh, or, or see it in the abstract, but not in the concrete. So that's one aspect. Um, there's, I do think that creating commons, we have to worry about enclosure. Absolutely, and, and that way, the, the the legal status of any IP we might create, I, uh, if we wanted to remain in the commons and to remain uh, something that is useful for all, I think that matters a lot. And people are protective of their secret sauce. I don't think, as you said, your your thing about designing from trust. Uh, so I don't think this is the most important concern. Maybe we should have waited five minutes. Mm. <laughs> That's okay. Well, we can catch everybody up. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the whole, another thing I, I, I've been talking about, which is not about ownership, but about the, the, the issue of face. I don't know if you remember. Uh, people are protective of something they see as half-baked uh, because they're worried about, oh, it's not final, it's not good enough to show the world yet, it's work in progress, and uh, my reputation is a bit at stake. And connection is never finished. Connection is always in progress. Uh, so anything we do in that space is always, uh, we need to be reassured that it's something that, uh, won't be enclosed, nobody will run away with it, but nobody will judge us on this emerging thing. We're dealing with emergence a lot and it mm -hmm. changes how the, the, the notion of sharing. So basically incentivizing sharing, there's so many dimensions. Uh, there's ownership, there's emotional, there's uh, and perceived value. Uh, and, and trying to help people understand the value of this in-progress network building and, and, and network of people, network of ideas, network of whatever. Uh, and, 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 and making it a thing of value even when it's necessarily unfinished is part of mm -hmm. it. But I think we need to worry about. Uh, well, welcome all. Most of you joined in the middle of Marc Antoine's sentence, so I figured I'd catch you up to what the what we were kicking around. Uh, this is the generative commons call, and uh, last week after our call, I mentioned this to a friend, and he said, "Well, is there really a problem?" Which I then asked on the Mattermost chat, "Is is this an issue?" And we think it is. And part of the problem is it's an obscure issue. It's an issue that that uh, a few of us care about a lot. 
uh, but more of us ought to care about more. And I'm not paraphrasing Marc Antoine here. I'm sort of uh, adding in some some to the conversation. Um, but also, I think this is part. This feels to me like it's part of the conversation about how to switch from scarcity mindset to abundance mindset, philosophically as a whole, um, which is really important because. Uh, Cap well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna overgeneralize here, but capitalism kind of ate our brains back around the industrial revolution. Uh, and suddenly everything had a price. Suddenly everything was a market and competitive. Suddenly we sort of moved into this place of a business's job is to sequester natural resources. There were enclosure movements around everything. People got pushed off the land. Uh, the ways people made a living went from self-subsistence to have must get a job or you can't buy things to, to have your family survive. All of that happened. And we're in some kind of punctuated equilibrium right now. We're in some kind of deep transitional phase that may or may not include most jobs dissolving. Because um, I, I actually think we're heading toward the great unemployment. I think automation, this, this machine learning thing is incredibly powerful. Uh, machines just get cheaper, faster, smarter, better. And humans get older, more expensive, want, you know, uh, crankier, they need to be managed, all that kind of thing. And, and the battle between if, if a machine can do this task and a human can do this task, which one would you pick? That battle is lost easily by the human. And worse, in some contexts, if, uh, if it's a legal context like screening for cancer, um, if the algorithm does a better job than the human, you will be sued for not turning the job over to an algorithm then the question becomes, uh, can humans become cyborgs in the middle? Can they become centaurs? And those two words are being used for human augmentation or amplification, which then preserves jobs. Anyway, I went on a long tangent, but, but if we're going into a world where lots and lots and lots and lots of work is going to be automated away and places where people can make a living are gonna start kind of disappearing on us, um, we need to have some kind of different mindset where there's an assumption of abundance, where there's maybe it's a basic income that's a whole sort of political economic discussion that we don't have to have here. But, but I think a piece of what we're aiming for or a piece of what showed up in my head when I started thinking about the Generative Commons Agreement was how do we turn the earth and prepare a way to work together to create that abundance together and still make a good living while doing so? And, that's, and it's different philosophically from the old method of making a living which wasn't so much together, it was like next to each other. Um, and, and so one of the questions Marc Antoine just asked is, those of us who already sort of have this frame of mind, why aren't we collaborating more or interchanging more information? Is that kind of, I, I don't know how you phrase it exactly, I don't remember, but yeah, do you want the, to go back there? We're, we're, we seem to be quite willing to exchange information, but working together in teams seems to be like, we're connecting people, but we're not working connector to connector so much. I find that fascinating. Anyone, and because we've all developed our own secret sauce of how to do the connection, how to do the facilitation, how to do this. And there's no unified field theory behind it so that we can unify those practices. And, and I, I, will, I will add another small tangent in here, which may be relevant, which is I'm, I'm discovering a simple way of explaining OGM and it's maybe my current favorite, is that we are um, we want to be the glial cells in the new global brain, in the emerging global brain. Now, most people think that neurons do all the work in the brain, and glia, glial cells, and there's several kinds of glial cells. Glial cells are like the glue. Glial cells hold the neurons in place. Glial cells kind of branch between neurons. They help. They attach to the myelin, but they actually play some role as neurotransmitters as well. And and I'm I'm making the analogy because I think moving towards some kind of global mind, global brain. Uh, the internet was clearly the, the superconducting lubricant that started our hyperconnecting. But as Mark, Mark Antoine just said, we're not actually collaborating that much. The tools don't fit together. The data doesn't fit together. Each of us is on a different path. <clears throat> so, so a piece of OGM's mission, I think, is to find and connect the tools, the bodies of data, the bodies of work, the communities, so that we can go sort out this global brain thing. And so, so I'm using this, this analogy of glial cells because I don't know that we're going to invent the group process that dissolves conflict, but boy, I know dozens of people who are doing brilliant work on that front and they're each separately sort of doing brilliant work. <clears throat> and how do we make them easy to find? How do we connect, interconnect their work so that it's more useful? 
because it's super powered, all those kinds of things. And it's, it's, the, it's the glue work, it's the connective work, it's the holding in place work, it's the making things visible and functional work that I think is, is a lot of uh, what we're doing. And then back to the topic at hand. And to do that well, we need to figure out a way to blend ideas and blend data and blend organizations that makes each organization feel comfortable about what they're doing and where we're all heading together. And that was just a riff of current thinking. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> uh, great, uh, great intro. Mark and Jerry, wonderful start for this conversation. A uh, quick thought, uh, I think we need a word in addition to uh, abundance and scarcity uh, and maybe adequacy, maybe sufficiency. In other words, there are definitely things that there's not an abundance of, but hey, you know, you had enough. You know, there are definitely carbs <laughs> well, of, of all kinds, not just ones we eat. So that's one thing is to have a, have a category for that. And kind of related to that and kind of related to what Mark said, yeah, there's, there's this other interesting kind of psychic scarcity of it isn't even just status it's like because you could have adequate or sufficient status but then there's some kind of a threat to it and then all of a sudden you're thrust into status scarcity and you start doing uh non-common non-common nurturing things in order to try to either re-establish or or better establish uh your status and so we need both uh you know, uh, soft glove metrics around that so that we can, because people do not like even to even to have their status described. You know, we need to be able to handle that with care and with care that is uh, sufficient to induce a sense of adequacy when we're in fact, you know, I mean, the old joke, I'm okay, you're okay, or I'm okay, you're not okay. You know, I mean, it, it was, for the first time it was uttered, it was profound, and it immediately turned into a sarcastic cliche. That process by which things, you know, get get devalued between how status supports get turned into sarcastic cliches is, um, you know, it's psychic cannibalism. It's it's weird ooh, how it works. Ooh, psychic cannibalism, I like. Um, so anyhow, this just to get you get you going. So, John, you're pulling a really important and interesting thing that, that like raises its head every now and then, which is the difference between abundance and something like enough. Uh, and my wife is, is publishing a book right now that has the eight superpowers for thriving in a world of flux. Uh, and one of her superpowers is called Know You're Enough. And it's not a contraction of Know You Are Enough, which is an interesting uh, phenomenon itself. It's know you're enough. Where, when do you have enough? And abundance implies overabundance, implies surfeit, implies like woohoo, which isn't necessarily what everybody means by the word. So I like that you're driving us toward more accuracy on it. And um, there's some words that feel like barely enough. So satisfying fears like barely enough to me. It doesn't feel like sort of comfortably enough. Yeah. Um, and, and, and also there's a whole separate little uh, riff I do sometimes on the difference between resilience and sustainability versus thriving and flourishing. Yep. And, and the, the analogy I use to explain that is that a rubber band is, is elastic. It bounces back to its original shape and sustainability and resilience seem to imply elasticity. Like we took a blow, like a, a tsunami hit the shoreline and we were able to kind of come back to where we were. We're thriving and flourishing are more like plastic, which can reshape itself to some new environment and can change a lot. And thriving and flourishing kind of open the lid, open the top for change, for productive change, for constructive change, for creating a system that's better than it was before. And, and I, I don't know if everybody would agree that, you know, in reading in into those words, uh, those particular attributes or, or dynamics. Um, but, I, but I think that, that um, if we're trying to switch people to an abundance mindset, which is a happy meme, like it's out there and a lot of people are working on that, do we need to change the phrasing around abundance mindset? Is that, is that like, do, do we need to get people to understand when they have enough doesn't feel really compelling? Like it feels like you're gonna cut them off at their third drink or something like that. Um, uh, any thoughts? Just real quick, uh, while, I, while I'm at a red light here. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, 
abundant electricity. You know, maybe um, there's some complexities. There's definitely the issues of storage and transmission and, and sunk cost and infrastructure, which will keep the price up. But I think that's the one area where the abundance people are, are one. It's an example of an area where the abundance thinking and the contrariness of the abundance thinking is an appropriate way to jar us because we, we it's hard for us to think about a world of free electricity or near next to free electricity and we should we should try to get it it's, it's within reach and we should think about it because it has significant properties that's very very different than enough <laughs> in enough for anything like food and then right. also enough for status those are there's just very different uh operations going on there and and so our understanding needs to reflect those differences i, I love that john and we, we may well be entering an era uh, of energy too cheap to meter ironically not from nuclear but from solar and wind from renewable right. yeah. um, and in particular because once you've installed a solar installation the maintenance costs are relatively low but you're not feeding it fossil fuels all the time so there's no there's no deep cost ongoing and if you can do enough of that without destroying the earth, making the photovoltaics, which is its own issue, but if you can make enough of it, then suddenly you have, for example, enough, enough power to do desalinization at the shorelines everywhere and to turn the ocean into potable water and to replenish the aquifers and a bunch of other stuff because, because it was you know, waste energy anyway. Um, so, so weird things that nobody would expect come to mind. And the experiment that, I'm, that comes to my mind when I think about this is, and I just put this in my brain a couple of days ago because this came up in conversation, Xerox Park, the place that invented, that sort of didn't quite invent, but perfected the mouse and the windowed interface and a bunch of stuff like that, they traded money for time. And by that, I mean, at one point when like, computer memory was exotically expensive and displays were like character displays, everybody had a character, you know, my first computer was an Apple II Plus with a 40 column uppercase only uh, amber screen display. That was my first home computer. And I was really excited when I got a Bidec 80 column card and I got 80 columns across and fake descenders, not real descenders, but fake descenders so I could do upper and lower case. But at Xerox Park, they bought every worker, every, every knowledge worker, every inventor at Park, they gave them a megabyte of memory, a megapixel display, and a megabit uh, network connection. They connected all the computers, which wasn't being done, period. And then they said, now let's see what happens. They gave them yep. something that was incredibly scarce, made it, abund made it a crazy abundant, and now we're busy wasting. There's a whole bunch of people who prefer the command line and hate the Windows interface because we are wasting insane cycle doing this thing we're doing right now, except it makes it accessible to everybody, right? And by, by wasting a lot of that resource, we made it really simple here. Um, and Vincent is saying we should probably do a check-in and it's probably a good idea because now we've got uh, enough people here. So thank, thanks, Vincent. Um, let, me, let me see if anybody has any thoughts Great. to follow up on that and then we'll pause Great. and do uh, that. Okay. Thanks, John. And thanks for dragging these cool issues into the conversation. They're, they're really important. Any other thoughts on this? On this? <coughs> then, then let's do a brief check-in. Uh, how about uh, Michael, Judy, John? You're going to pass? OK, good. Um, <laughs> let's go uh, Judy, John, Hank. Well, hi, everybody. Um, let's see. It's an unusual day for me today. I'm doing a Pure Gadget podcast later today at 12.45 Eastern time. Um, it's, a, it's posted a bunch of different places. I think Charlotte's put it just about everywhere. Uh, but it's talking about um, challenging conversations. You know, when do you need to do them? Uh, under what circumstances? How might you approach it? How do you deal with entrenchment? That kind of thing. With a co-person, uh, Robert from Pittsburgh, who's a, he's actually the coach for the rowing team um, that Charlotte's part of, but he's, he's done a bunch. He's taught some courses like this at college level, teaching undergraduates that argument is the beginning of learning in a sense, um, and, but constructive argument as opposed to different types. So that's kind of what I'm preoccupied with today. Um, 
life mm -hmm. is good. <laughs> Thank you. A uh, brief ironic side note. Um, there's a famous book about difficult conversations, might even be titled that with four authors, I think, one of whom was on the board of a company that April used to be part of, which had a meltdown because they avoided difficult conversations. Like he did not live up to any part of what he'd been writing, you know, famous yeah. for writing about. That was pretty interesting. There's, uh, actually, then, there's, there's a whole string of books right now. The first one I read was Crucial Conversations. Yeah. And then, then after that came difficult conversations within the last five years. And now the newest one is Compassionate Conversations. Um, and it's an interesting kind of trilogy, just Sounds from cool. the standpoint of various perspectives. But pretty much it's conversations, difficult conversations are important, you know, and it's, it's especially interesting to try to do it in a group. I mean, it's hard enough to do it with one other person. I'll say. But the context of peer gaji is, you know, how do you have a difficult conversation in a group, such yeah. as you know, let's say this group, and there were some uh, polarizing issues or whatever. So I'll be interested to see how the how it goes. Thanks, Judy. I I'm compelled to add a second side note, which is there's a hostage negotiator named Chris Voss. <laughs> <clears throat> and he's written a really good book. I've heard him, I've met him, shaken his hand, uh, heard him speak. And one of the really interesting things he says is that he considers no the beginning of the conversation. Now, remember, he's negotiating with, with hostage takers, but, but when the other person has said no to something, they, they feel like they have more power, like they've said no and nothing, you know, that the world is still spinning. So they can then enter a conversation with a different frame of mind. So he's happy when, when somebody says, nope, no way I'm doing that or, or whatever, like that gives them power. That does, that's insightful because it does mean they're engaged. Yeah. They're at least thinking about it. They're not just blowing you off completely. Exactly. Anyway, I think it'll be interesting. And I think it's very relevant for this in the active sense, although it could be in the, in, a, in the connective internet sense too, because I'm sure that as we move into commons conversations, there will be disagreements about various dimensions of things. And the openness of those disagreements is a measure of the goodness of the organization. I remember one more anecdote and I'll quit, but my husband who was a psychiatrist um, used to tell stories about, you know, the couple that comes in for marital counseling. And when he asks them how things are going and what their areas of difficulty are, half the time they respond, oh, well, we really don't have any arguments. And then he knows they're really in trouble because they should be having arguments. <laughs> so anyway. Thank you. Um, so let's and I apologize for making the, the check-in slower than it ought to be, ought to be and Sorry, I took wandering off into other things. So let's do brief check-ins. And also uh, per Vincent's comments in, in the chat here, like and any thoughts sort of connecting you back to this topic or grounding you in this topic. Uh, so let's go John, Hank, Vincent. Uh, yeah, I think I, I came in <laughs> early and, and kind of made my connection, so I'm good. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, let that stand. Sounds great. Thanks. Um, Hank, Vincent, Stacy. Yeah. Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, uh, European time, I conducted a workshop at the Urban Living Labs Summit online about uh, leveraging uh, distributed collective intelligence. Uh, to me, that has to do with creating a global generative commons in which uh, conversations uh, in a non-hierarchic space can uh, take place, enrich each other, and move towards uh, generating uh, appropriate actions. So there will eventually be a, a recording of that workshop for anyone that's interested in listening. That sounds great. Love to see that. Thank you, Hank. Um, Vincent, Stacy, Kylie. Um, this time has been quite difficult for me to get to the last few weeks. Um, so yeah, excited to hear a kind of like synthesis of what has happened or where the conversation has went from like the first few calls. Um, I've been still thinking about it like on the daily um, I had a call this morning, uh, Michael, you'll be <laughs> pleased, uh, someone named Ali from the um, CTA, the Collaborative Tech Alliance. And uh, yeah, it's like after 
you know, you have a conversation where it's like, oh my gosh, there's so much overlap. And then the questions come up like, okay, well, we paid someone to do this. Uh, where do we go from here? What pieces are you willing to put in the open and collaborate with? Uh, we understand that you probably have intellectual property that you want some of these things to be in your name, but which piece of them can we share? And, and, and so I feel like this is just like, yeah, the constant question, at least uh, because I'm working on a tool that sits in that intersection of like connecting people and the, the kind of train of thought. And, and I actually probably need some help. Uh, I, I would like to write up a very short and succinct article explaining why we all got here. And I think it's like, we wanna build things to change the world, right? We think of them as like objects. And then the next step is like, but then we find all these other things that other people are building. And we go, oh, wait a minute, what do we do now? And then we realize, okay, either we can merge projects, compete or interoperate. And if you get to the interoperate piece, then you go down to the next ladder, which is, well, in order to interoperate, we need to have some sort of common language. And that common language for a software platform is typically a categorization system, a ontology, a, a way to connect the different like schemas and also the social stuff. There's, 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 there's lots of different layers, but I feel like, yeah, that's just, uh, and then the generative commons conversation of like the, why do we actually want to do this? How is it going to be beneficial for both uh, parties to do it? Um, and so, uh, and I'd love to hear if anyone wants to rip off of what I just said, but yeah, that, that's, that's my check-in. Uh, this has been in my heart and mind for a while, the conversation and excited to see where things go. Thanks, Vincent. It, feel, it feels, and I just put this in the other chat, it feels like we're sort of negotiating the synaptic dynamics like we're all little, and, and Judy may smile at this, we're all sort of little dendrites reaching out to each other to make contact to, to create the global brain. And it's like, all right, who are you and what do you have to offer? And who am I and how, like, how do we collaborate? And we don't know what the neurochemicals are. The neurotransmitters are a mystery to us. Like, and, and each of us has sort of developed a bunch of stuff on our own and we're trying to figure out how to make this all connect. Go ahead, Mark Antoine. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, I did have a bit of a, uh ho-hum reaction to ontologies are the way to connect and categories are the way to connect. No, it's we all have our categories and our ontologies necessarily. And, and, and because we're also individuals, we're not neurons, uh, we're also holons. And that means we have to find a way to connect across different ontologies. So it's, it's a meta connection rather than harmonizing necessarily. And, and the importance of, of course, we need a way to agree on how to do the meta connection, which is not necessarily simple. Uh, and, and it's the same problem at any level we're looking at. We all have our idea of this is important, this is right, this is our part of the puzzle, and we want to protect it because it's part of our identity. And that's not wrong. The question is, how can we create this? Thing above all our individual parts that brings them together without losing the individuality and the specificity of each of our visions. And, that's really, and it is more really complicated important. to do it that way. Yeah, I'll say. Yeah, I mean, if this were a top-down kind of organization, you just assign people to different parts of the puzzle, wait for their results to come back, plug them in and hope they hope they work, right? <clears throat> and then the whole thing would be owned by the corporation and so done. Uh, so we're busy trying to figure out, sort out some other way of working together that allows us to be individuals and to bring our individual contributions in and still make this work. <clears throat> Thank, uh, thanks, Mark Antoine. Let's go, uh, Stacy, Kylie, and then Mark Antoine for checking if you want to. Uh, Stacy, go ahead. Oh, I, 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 th I thought we couldn't hear you, but you're fine. Okay, um, I'm looking forward to a call with Philip later to hopefully discuss all these things you know, that we've been talking about at least for the past few days. And uh, maybe he can help me translate <laughs> what I want to be able to say. And that's it. <laughs> awesome. Um, Kylie, um, thanks for being here. Hi, uh, nice to meet most of you. Um, 
I've kind of I've dropped in this time. Um, it's actually twelve thirty a.m. here at the well, moment. Well, so thank you. Don't expect too much sense out of me. Uh, however, I did want to to start to get a bit of a sense of um, of what's happening in this um, in this group. Vincent's been talking to me about it a lot. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm going to be moving to a more conducive time zone at some point in the next month. So um, actually, it's, it's interesting that uh, one of the things that I have to do in order to do that move is to apply for an exemption from a travel ban. Um, I'm in Australia and, you know, we're still a prison island. And um, anyway, one of the things that, um, that's kind of come up um, in amongst that is the needing to sort of spell out why. And one of the reasons that we're using is that we're looking at business. So we're developing a bunch of software products that we want both to be able to, um, uh, you know, sell, I suppose, in, in sort of a private sense, but also make available in commons as well. So it's a very interesting topic. Thank you. Um, Mark Antoine than me. <clears throat> I feel I've spoken a lot, um, but yeah, the, 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 I think that <clears throat> I've been worrying a lot about data integrality and concept mapping because that's my gist, but I'm really interested now in the question that was asked of me recently about integrality between these social technologies we all use. Like if somebody's a champion of Nonviolent conversation, somebody's a champion of theory you present saying, how do we unify those in a conversation? And, and, and having a kind of uh, first principles of understanding this is now my one of my gnawing questions. So thank you for saying that because one of the things that feels to me like low, hang <clears throat> low hanging fruit for OGM to work on some small subset is to take pedagogy, liberating structures, uh, nonviolent communications, uh, whatever, whatever, but, but in particular, why, uh, why is democracy pattern language? In particular, bodies of work that have already been synthesized into something like a pattern language, which is, thank you so much, fabulous, love you so much for having done this, different groups around the world, and then making them easily available, like bringing them in so that, uh, so that a muggle, an ordinary citizen, who's like, ah, we're stuck, like, what do we do with our team? so that they could find their way to group process, maybe have some guidance for implementing it. If not, find somebody to hire, to bring in, to run it for them virtually, whatever. Like, how, how do we make that? And, and one of the things I wanna propose as a, as, a, as a possible framing for this is actually a frame. I, I, the thing that lights up in my head is a frame for an iPad app or a tablet app that where the frame can hold a variety of different things inside of it and is a guide for meetings. And so, so this frame basically has a, a, an advice module or a chatbot you can connect to. And, and, and if you uh, find your way to uh, World Cafe, then there's a frame that World Cafe has that steps in and says, okay, great. So do this, do this, do this. Uh, here's a template. If, you're, if, if the exercise has a template, it brings in a template. But, but the frame allows you to switch back and forth between group process while you manage the group process of your team or something like that and, make, and makes the bodies of work available through either question answer, chatbot, uh, decision tree, query search, discovery, or human uh, human router to the things. Go ahead, Mark Antoine. I feel this is the last thing I'd want to automate. We were speaking about the thrivability of and automation of work and disappearance of work, uh, but can we make the community of practice available and find a, find a way to provide wormholes for people who want to experiment doing combinations of practices. But this is such a, you know, such a field where the theory doesn't give you that much. You need to have lived experience of those practices to practice them well. And what I'd really like is uh, having uh, access to, to a, global communities of practice for all of this. And, so, yeah. so that's entirely the goal is to have experts on hand whom you can hire and pay money to, to come in and do those things. But my ulterior, ulterior ultimate goal is to have these practices, just to have humans absorb these practices so that we're all better facilitators, co-thinkers, et cetera, et cetera, which eventually means that, hey, I'm, I'm now 
fluent in this and I'm going to pick this and drop it in and boom, look, we can now implement open space really easily because look, there's a really simple way to do that. And here's some tools. But for me, this is like the full employment act for people who are currently expert holders of this kind of these bodies of knowledge. And, and I want to stand up on top of open global mind, a little consulting business or a, a, a marketplace to find those people and hire them. T -t Tools for augmenting the capacity of those practitioners for me is absolutely an important goal. And again, tools for helping people experiment with new combinations. You know, I, I, I just had a wild idea totally flashed through my mind of a kind of world wrestling uh, championship where we, we have many people using different techniques and see who can solve this problem. <laughs> and so I, I pose this as a cage match. I want to have a cage match with other people, other users of other tools around a common topic and just see like how we come up with ideas and mix and match, right? Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Uh, and cage match is a terrible metaphor because it's combative it's because only one person comes out the winner. So, so what's, what's the equivalent of a cage match where, there's, where everybody wins? Like uh, uh, a sandbox? Uh, it's called an ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> Stacey, go ahead. If you, kept, if you kept the cage match and you just considered that the structure that was producing the cage match was the collective commons, then it works. That makes sense. Um, and there's, we can play with the metaphors and the other, other ways of going about it. But, but I'll just connect that idea back to our current conversation, which is if there is a frame that's going to include lots of different kinds of methods and processes and whatever else, then we have to have a framework where all the people who created those bodies of work are like, yes, love to have my work inside that frame. Right. And I, I will point out that currently there is something sort of like that. We call it the web browser. And everybody agrees to have their content show up in my web browser. And originally when the web was young, there were people like, no, 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 you're copying content into your memory. So that's a copyright violation. And luckily that was stamped out quickly or the web would have died. <clears throat> um, and so now we at least can browse content and do stuff with it, but it's not really connected. It's not really alive and useful in ways that I think could, that, that, that are just like lying at hand in front of us. Um, so how might, how might we do that? What, what, where do we need to push to make those things come to life. And, and the nature of this conversation is, and under what rules of play should we be doing that? And I'm trying to figure out how generative commons can be more like, uh, more like Calvin ball with guidelines and less like the marquee of Queensberry boxing rules and a lot less like, uh, several layers of contractual agreements, right? Even though somewhere in the back need to be some contracts, needs to be some agreements. Uh, and, and one of the things we want to wrap ourselves around because we really like it is the creative commons, which is a very nice way of managing copyright issues uh, in the world. So that's great. And, and like, we don't have to do that work. Somebody else did it really elegantly. What do we wrap around it? How do we bring these things together into a bigger idea of how to play together? And how does something that's more formal preserve a notion of play? That seems important to me because a, a, a piece of what we're talking about here is, is sort of, I think, playing our way to some solutions to important problems. Because even if it's hard work, it should be hard fun and we can actually do this together. Uh, and I think in our last call, Hank, you had recommended we contact some comics artists and other illustrators and creative people to challenge them to explain these sorts of things visually and with some humor and so forth. Is that right? Yeah, I thought that's a good idea because we're all talking at a, a fairly high intellectual level here. Uh, sometimes the level is even too high for me when it gets into uh, to real uh, back office uh, IT stuff. But if we had artists or, or visualizers uh, or cartoonists, they could translate it to the level of anyone we thought would be interested in this. And that anyone might include the politicians or, or people at NGOs or, or young school children or whoever we thought would want to be contributing to, to, to what the gener generative commons is. So that, that was my suggestion, yeah. I like it. Um, any other thoughts? Where we are here?
Uh, well, there are a lot of complicated uh, loose ends. I, I like where this is going. It's you're, we're, we're facing up to the true complexity. Um, one one simpler thought is the difference between a a kind of uh, ex expert or practitioner, maybe journeyman level um, fluency provided by the tool, and then the oh, but you 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 really don't. You haven't, you haven't begun on this path and you need more steps at the beginning. And then there's also the, oh, you're, you're an expert and, and in fact, you're at the expert level of creating new, um, new modifications of these tools. Um, and it strikes me that maybe you were heading towards something like the middle level in this sense. Yeah, there, there's this group of people John, you just broke up a little bit. Uh, it strikes me like we're heading toward what? Um, the, the middle level. So in other words, uh, if you're listed, you're listed as an OGM uh, provider and you have fluencies, like I have fluency in, in liberating structures. I have fluency in, uh, and uh, the group, the group certifies that. The group says, I'm okay. Am I dropping out? Uh, a tiny bit, I'm but I think, I, think, I think we mostly heard you. I'll, I'll come back later. Okay. Well, um, you're, heading, you're heading right toward one of the constructs I was thinking we were doing, but in two, two build OGM calls ago, I was dissuaded from using the language of guilds and quests. But, but my entire motivation for guilds was to borrow sort of the, the guild uh, properties or dynamics of, hey, we bring apprentices into this craft oriented guild that has expert knowledge about some set of things that define this guild as opposed to that guild. Uh, and then we turn these people into yeomen or uh, uh, sort of the, the, the mid layer, I'm forgetting what the second term, uh, journeyman. Uh, yeoman or journeyman is kind of the middle layer where, where they're good enough that they can do the work wherever they want. And then we have masters of guilds who are the deep experts and you know anybody can, can contribute to improving the guild craft. Uh, but that's exactly where I was heading with that language. And we haven't found a substitute for guilds. Circles seems too neutered. It doesn't seem interesting enough. But, but this idea of nurturing people in community, I think is really important. Um, and so and so the places where you would find the experts to hire in would be metaphorically the guild halls, right? So right now we need a Cooper. So we go to the Cooper's guild hall and we like shout, hey, we need a, this level ex expert Cooper who's available. And that's, what ha you know, that's how it works. Or uh, the master Cooper says, ah, I think you'd get along with Bobby, the Cooper who like doesn't drink as much as, as Jim. Why don't we get Bobby over here to work with you? Uh, you know, just... Um, Human, net, human networks, human connections, making the bridging the apps as well. Um, so I, I would love to stand up things like that. I'm not quite sure what we call them and, and uh, how they work. So uh, part of my effort with the early build OGM calls just a couple of weeks ago was like, what's a guild? How does it work? How do we structure it? Where do we put it on the wiki? Who wants to be part of a guild? What are the first couple of guilds we name? I'm totally interested in having that conversation, but it got a little stuck. Just, okay, great. And yes, and Jackson on this too, of course. And um, let's let's continue that. But let me just make a quick observation about the, the, this, the narrative that you relayed, that there were two big different levels of uh, recognition, consent, or agreement. There was the level of, oh, I'm in the guild hall. Anybody in the guild hall belongs to the guild, okay. And then the, you did a really interesting thing, you said, uh, well, so and so, you know, drinks a lot or whatever. In other words, you, you switched it into the the both the intimate level, but also the um, hearkening back to that conversation about sufficiency and abundance and scarcity. It's like there's a there's an important switch that happens when we when we go to the level of okay, yes, I accept that you're a guild member, but are you really the right guild member for me, you personally, for me personally right now? And therefore we get to have, or we have to have, or we should have, and perhaps with some guidelines, 
a more a moderately more confrontive test of the fit and the, the, the interesting thing to me is that, that the the applying of the different standard how when at the point of individual contracting you you switch to a, a higher a different standard and that's completely legitimate everybody sees that as legitimate however calling out in the middle of the guild meeting so and so is a you know is a bad carpenter you, you would you know? never you would never shout that out across the hall but you'd I'll, never I'll shout that yeah you know, so there is so no way that, that would be shouted out across the hall right right so well there is a way but it wouldn't be fun yeah Right. So, I mean, I think that the, the switching here, the switching and the, and the intimacy of the evaluation, I had an earlier crazy vision while you were talking about the, uh, the cage battle cage match where, or cage match. Yeah. Somebody would stand up and say, well, I think I could do that. And I, and the group would immediately vote. You know, the group would say, well, yeah, I, I'll give him, you know, on a scale of five, I'll give him a two for that, you know, or whatever, whatever. I'll rank vote him right now. And that you would instantly be, legitimated or delegitimated by your peers and i thought wow that Ouch. would be brutal yeah. you know you would that that talk about i'm not enough <clears throat> that would be that would be a world you would not want to live in but i mean i think we have to keep playing with those dynamics to understand how all that works and um i'm i'm flashing back to the the, the days of monitor when it was on its way down. And um, I was never in one of these meetings, but I was told about these meetings where you have a facilitator's meeting and everybody knows all the facilitation tool. And there's a form that the corporation is trying to use and trying to get you to use with each other. But because everybody is so hip to the tool, all the uses of the tool are meta and have these layered barbed, you know, <laughs> eight, eight angles and and so the whole thing broke down and i don't know if that's the that's the cause for the the death of monitor but um it was a contributing factor to the death of the monitor group which was you know interestingly harvard business school faculty were the core principles and they couldn't do they couldn't do their own uh, process Shocked to, hear, shocked to hear the things that came out of Harvard didn't work. That's just like <laughs> really shocking to me. Yeah. Um, I, right I, just want to, I just want to go back briefly to the drunken person example I gave, which was a clumsy, clumsy way of saying at some point, this is not a database lookup and a, who has the attributes, but it's a personal introduction. It's like, you're a teetotaler. This person likes to drink. You're probably not a good chemistry match is where I was kind of aiming. But then also the notion that in a guild, in a healthy guild, which you just described an unhealthy guild-like thing at Monitor. In a healthy guild, you take care of everybody. And you know, it's like, if somebody's drinking too much, yeah, figure out how to deal with that because it's part of having them uh, work well. Uh, if somebody doesn't understand the craft well, you make sure they do somehow. Uh, you kind of bring everybody up into uh, being a full capacity human, aiming for the highest, best uh, you know, uh, thing in the world. Go ahead, Mark Anton. The question of... Uh... Guild nurturance is absolutely fundamental. And it's one of the big difficulties. Like if you look at Ostrom's work on commons, you know, there's a, a community that builds around uh, stewarding the co common stewardship. And that community, because they have this external goal, common stewardship, that creates a shared interest, which promotes nurturance. Uh, and, and that's also possible in uh, a guild which has you know, it's protecting itself against uh, quote unquote bad practitioners. So, but there's this notion of inside outside. And there's always this question of like, we speak a lot about uh, sharing goals and lying in goals. But again, there's, there's usually this idea of shared goals, which is possible when you have an, people congregating around a goal. So the goal becomes the, the definer of inside outside. And when you're speaking of nations, nation states, uh, for example, then you cannot assume shared goals. And when you're speaking of, on the one hand, the community of practice, but on the other hand, wanting to open it up and make it into the global mind, which I think is very much a goal, then that means we don't have an inside outside. Uh, so we want nurturance, but we want openness. And there's a conflict there that I'm not sure how to resolve because we want to 
nurture insofar as people are sharing the basic goals of nurturance. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's a paradox. I don't have an answer. I'm just pointing out the paradox. I, I think you're putting a really nice other language around this thing that's in the back of my head as well, which is there's something about the generative commons agreement or general commons, which is intentional. It's like, as long as someone's intentions are to put things in the shared space so that we can all use them, as long as someone's intentions are to get better at what they're doing, as long as someone's intentions are not to cause harm and ruckus, you know, in the space, like that is all cool. Like we want more of that and we want the community to help everybody sort of become what they can become and honor what they brought to the party. Um, how you do that is, is tangly. Um, Vincent, and then I want to go to Michael because you were posting about uh, Vincent's points and I'd love to hear what you think about what you just posted in both chats. Go ahead, Vincent. So I feel like the best way to, uh, to actually like signal intentions is just having conversations. Um, and the other best way for signaling intentions is actually just doing something that aligns with what you say. And those two things are intention because uh, the more time that you spend talking to people and like building that trust, the less time you spend building things and actually doing the things that you say that you believe. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, I agree. It's com it's complicated, messy human dynamics and, uh, and, and, one of the things I love about our Thursday check-in calls is that we're seeing who's in the room and how we think and what we think and how these conversations unfold. And that's fruitful because it gives us some of the things you just mentioned. Um, if you'll step in, Michael. Sure. Um, I mean, I was just uh, mentioning, mentioning in the chat that, um, you know, I can write better than I can talk, but uh, that I, I feel like, um, we're all of us in all of the groups like this that exist that, you know, what Vincent was speaking to of coming into a group like the CTA uh, and, and having, having assets and needs and strengths and weaknesses um, and trying to figure out how to cooperate um, I, I also mentioned in the Mattermost chat, I, Mark Antoine, I don't know if that was a typo or not, but you, you typed cooperative and, and which, which sounded like. I, I typed competitive, actually. You typed competitive. Competitive, competitive. <laughs> sorry, sorry. And it is a portmanteau. <laughs> it is, it is. I love it. Um, you know, mine. I love it. Um, it's great. Um, it's, you know, like, how do you be competitive? Um, in, in a way that isn't um, zero sum, you know, that isn't beyond zero sum, but accepting huh? beyond yeah, zero yeah. sum. So, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, marketplace, marketplaces are what we've all grown up on and, you know, trying to figure out how we you know, survival of the fittest. Um, it's very American in particular, but, you know, Western in general and capitalist for sure. And, and we're, we're stuck in those structures. We're stuck with the, the money we have, the privilege we have, the assets we've developed. And we're looking for, and like <laughs> we have, Competitive, nominally cooperative, but but actually competitive entities and organizations who are all working toward the same thing, and not only do we, you know, there there are all there are people all over, including in this space right now or this greater OGM space, who you know really want to be the smartest person in the room. And, um, and that's an asset of sorts. And I mean, it's an asset for sure. And there are other people who are doing more, you know, as Vincent was saying, you know, just like making stuff happen as he, he certainly is. And, um, and there are just all these different strengths and weaknesses that all these people have 
and the structures for a commons I, I mean I just I keep observing all these people with their with their well-intentioned toe in the water and I, I count myself among them trying to figure out how do I like dive in and and not drown you know because like I'm scraping by in life in whatever ways and I've got incredible assets in another way and what is the structure for this? <laughs> I mean, it's a really basic question. Um, and in a capitalist system, you know, we have to deal with it with some pretty complicated contract making. And, you know, as, as, as Vincent was, you know, observing in this, in this group that we're involved in, we're all at different stages of the development of the tools we're building. We have overlap, we have, um, you know, we have, we have thoughts that we're smarter on this front or smarter on that front. Um, and it's stymieing um, when you're, it's, it's, it's a little easier. I mean, I think it's good to get to the brass tacks of this because it's, it's a lot easier having participated in OGM conversations for, you know, several months now. They can, you know, go on and on and people don't part with anything of value. In fact, they enhance their value by in conversation, sharing their intellectual assets. Um, but in the, you know, real world of, of change making, um, we're, we're stuck, you know, trying to, to make a living and, and we want to make change. It's just like, how, how, how do we do this? And I, I feel like I've sort of asked this question in a less pointed way before um, and maybe almost a broken record on it. Um, and, and of course, you know, it's like, be the change you want to see and take your assets and dump them in the commons and see what happens. But I don't even know how to do that, um, you know, if I truly wanted to. Um, and, and is this the commons? You know, what is OGM? And is OGM like, you know, is OGM paying its participants so that they can so that they can participate in the commons? Is OGM the foundation, the safety net that allows people to do this? And that's not clear, you know, to, to any of us. I mean, we, we all intend well. But, you know, I'm just, it, it's, it's both obvious and, and not. And, um, Judy, I want to, to hear turn the mic to say. Judy, but I also want to say, I just want to replay what you said for the last five minutes, like every morning, Michael, because it seems really central to what, to our quest. Like you, you, you're, you're totally scraping at the important issues in the middle, the slightly tender issues, because it has to do with personalities. And, and we've attracted a bunch of people who have a life mission, have done a whole bunch of work on different things and are, are trying to figure out how to put it in the middle and when nobody responds, it's like, ah, so, it's, it's, so I think, I think you just articulated a bunch of stuff really, really well. Sorry, Judy, off to, over to you. I, I totally agree with what Michael just said, because I think we're in this conceptual transition from two. And in the going to, we all need to not, to, to react differently to situations and present to ourselves differently in some ways. So part of what, what is involved, I think, is what we touched on in a call last week in terms of how do we enable <clears throat> those process changes and behavior changes as people come together? Because historically, with a, a hierarchical system, um, it's sort of like who puts the most knowledge on the table has the better voice in the room. And that doesn't contribute to collective understanding. It, continu it continues a verbal hierarchy of, you know, I'm going to say something smart, you're going to say something smart, three other people will say something smart, they become the inner circle, 
and smarts an arbitrary definition, but I think you've observed it very accurately in terms of how people are participating. And that requires a shift in human process. And because all of these entities are collections of humans, um, what we actually talked about last week was we need to identify maybe the sages of their mavens that could be part of a resource group, two groups who want to learn how to do this, that would mentor individuals who would then be a cornerstone in their group of perpetuating. I mean, that's the way process changes occur. Somebody embraces it and they just bring it in and live it. And the group goes, hey, that's pretty cool. You know, we could do that. <laughs> And so it's a it's kind of a seeding process. I think there can be, and it and it can be a facilitated process that might be income producing for the individuals who are mavens, if that's their desire. Um, it's kind of a shift to organizational dynamics instead of knowledge content per se, because if you want to get things done collectively, the knowledge is sort of a given. It's how you work together that is the new learning for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, it feels to me like you've opened up a big channel of inquiry for us, for all of OGM and for maybe us specifically in this set of conversations, um, but also that we ain't the first people to have posed these questions. There's a bunch of people trying to figure out what does post-capitalism look like and how do people collaborate? And, 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 and that there's a bunch of really, like there's a lot of water has flowed under this bridge. A lot of people are chewing on this right this moment around the world. Um, how do we collect up what some of them think? How do we invite a few of them to this conversation? How do we try out some of their platforms? Uh, you know, there's this co-makery. It's a platform I haven't actually tried, but it's a way of moving value around a community. Uh, everybody on blockchain and all the derivatives are trying to figure out how do you reward effort or do other kinds of things using cryptocurrencies, which I'm not a big fan of. <clears throat> but, but there's a whole bunch of different efforts to figure this out um, that we should learn from, borrow from, test, drive, uh, and figure out. But, but I, wasn't, I wasn't including that in my mental frame for this inquiry. And now I think it's like, ooh, this is actually really important because rather than glue together pieces that seem to be around and then put a nice like vanilla icing on top, like a buttercream icing on top of it. I think we actually sort of need to go look at bodies of work that are trying to get us into the, <clears throat> the abundance uh, frame of view and, and other sorts of things with the caveats that John put in the room about the word abundance. Any other thoughts on, on that? I'd love to hear what everybody thinks about, about that. And one of my questions to us all is how to frame that question. Because I'm like, I, don't, I wouldn't mind setting up a pop-up OGM call around specifically around that question. And I, I like, what do I call it? What is the post-capitalist platform? Nah, not sure that's going to attract more than two people. Um, how do we collab? How do we how do we make a living collaborating while sharing what we know? Maybe a little looser, more interesting. Like, wh what's the framing for the question? so that we can have some productive conversations around this and pull in what's, what's already understood around the world. Uh, I don't, uh, go ahead, John. John so, go ahead. yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a real tough one, uh, but I, one, my instinct at the moment is to, to do some separation and I'm not sure I've got all the, you know, I can label the pieces, but it seems to me like there's an, adequacy conversation around you know things like um uh basic income there's like how do we how do we not have such incredible discrepancies in in wealth or how do we not have homeless or starving people i mean that's a whole conversation and, and, and that's and, and that's more closely associated with the words post-capitalism mm -hmm. there's a subtler conversation that this group is is drawn to which is let's we, we're not saying that that one is fixed, but we're saying there's another one. There's another one that has to do with um, meritocracy, perhaps hierarchy. It has to do with with uh, getting getting the best of what's humanly possible to become available to to more people and to deal with all the contributors and consumers of that 
in some way that is satisfying, if not completely fair. And th there's possibilities there in that second conversation that would totally break down if you tried to apply them in the first instance. So if I can just, oh, I've said this before, but and, and I, 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 Jerry, I share your concerns about crypto, but if I was going to support a crypto, the, the, the crypto that's interesting to me is one that is uh, stabilized, asset backed, and has a conversion to fiat, which is uh, which is a penalty in effect, you know, like, yes, if you really, you, you, how do you earn this crypto? You earn this crypto by contributing. Mm -hmm. that, that's how it works. You contribute to the commons. And then how, what do you do with the crypto? Well, you can buy green things. You can buy things, but the only things that are available at, at a reasonable price are green things, or you can convert it back into fiat if you really need to, but, but that's at a discount. Or yeah. At, it's at, at a, a discount. Premium. So, you're, so you're not really going to, you're kind of encouraged First of all, you're encouraged to earn it. You're encouraged to earn it because now these things that you used to just give away occasionally get recognized, maybe maybe intermittently, maybe not all the time, just mm -hmm. to make use of the intermittent reinforcement principle like, hey, your, your peers have given you a thousand greenies. Um, but, but then, oh, gee, I got greenies. And who, what's the market for greenies? Well, the market for greenies is things like tutoring and and uh, you know, cleaning up stuff, and you know, saving animals, and blah blah blah. You know, so you 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 you're encouraging this whole economy, and you're deliberately separating it enough from the standard and fiat economy that it can survive. Because right now, you can't you can't pay volunteers. <laughs> you know, or you you can't pay people enough to do really important things that need to be done. You know, it's like it's. A, yeah. So, and, if, and a piece of my check-in is I'm actually trying to raise funds to have OGM fellowships where we actually can pay people who are showing up here and, and contributing to what OGM is looking to build. So, sorry, back to you. Yeah. So, no, I, I mean, I, I realize I'm not really, I'm not providing terms and, and, and clarity around this, but I think the distinction, the, the distinction in whether you attack the, what most people mean by post-capitalism, which is, hard currency it, it, one way to think of it is maybe that the post-capitalism there's a hard currency part of that problem and there's a soft currency part of that problem and it's easier to innovate on the soft currency side because people aren't uh as dug in mm -hmm. and yet you could you know you can imagine a future community in which you know people are are thrifty they're 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 using solar they're they're growing some of their own food and nobody is doing any McMansions and it's kind of working, but it, it's not that much fun, you know, because it's kind of pinched. It's not abundant. And yet you, you layer onto that, the soft currency model and you have people doing these nice exchanges uh, in a different, in a, in a way, in a different market, in a different economy. And the, and the, you figured out how to have the relationship between the two markets and there, and also to experiment because you can't answer all these questions when you implement something like this. You, you need, a, you need a, a sandbox that in which the new and the old and the enlightened and the mean <laughs> can all, can all kind of evolve together and, and, uh, and move, move towards something better. So anyhow. Thanks, John. Um, Vincent? Yeah, I, I, uh, to build off of what John said, I think the best, the best um, theory of change that I have is um, if we can artificiate uh, abundance in order to shift culture. Because once you've lived your entire life thinking that it's normal to share and do things in a way that cares about the commons, then no matter how much you're in actual poverty, I, I find it hard to believe like that you would just switch that on a dime. Like you would still treat people with dignity even if you didn't have what you needed. Um, and so, um, or, or yeah, or at least it would be there <laughs> to want to do that. And um, 
so yeah i think we have to kind of like artificiate the commons like like what if you know if somebody comes into ogm they're working on this really cool project but they have to spend 100 hours a week doing right doing everything and then because they're spending all their time working on doing every part of their thing then they're not actually spending time to try to take care of themselves in terms of like making money so then they have to hold on to it and so if you can give people the basic that they need to survive and they don't have to worry then they'll be more open to to then giving back to a system that gives them and so I think you have to artificiate that system. And so I think you need a, I think we need a group of people in OGM that are just like, we're gonna do the, like, you know, uh, OGM and Kiko Lab and a bunch of groups need to come together and say, we're gonna do like granting. We're gonna get lots of funding and we're just gonna pay people to, to do their thing and do what they love and what is getting them the most, it's getting the commons the most for the least amount of work for a person because they're putting their passion into it, it over it intersects with their skills. And so I think, I think, yeah, just being able to, some people just need to, I think we need to like look a little bit more carefully on like where the gaps are in our skill sets. Uh, for example, like I don't know any grant writers, period. Like I don't know a first name of somebody who I can call that does grant writing. And that's a problem in the generative commons because that's a piece that we need to be able to like work together as a system and be able to contribute in this way. So why are we not putting more energy into just finding the people that we need? We need accountants. We need like all these, we need lawyers. We need like all these people that uh, have diverse skill sets that are able to help our projects and our initiatives and our passions succeed in the context of also contributing to the collective. Um, thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, and Judy, is your hand up from before? Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, get it's okay. I can put it down. Oh, you, there you go. Thanks. Um, Hank, what's all this making you think of? Uh, yeah, actually uh, doing some of the things that have been talked about today. Like, for example, I, I very much triggered by what Vincent just said. Uh, I have the same thing. Uh, for example, I don't know how to, uh, well, I mean, I can name 20 things I'd like to, skill sets I'd like to be able to access, including grant writing, and I don't know anyone on a first name basis. But then I wonder what skill sets do I have that nobody on this call or nobody in OGM knows about, can we set up a kind of, uh, well, I don't know if the right word is library or-, or I don't think we had a directory that could do some of this stuff, man. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, I mean, I, I think a lot of the things that were, were said during this call are worthwhile taking forward. Uh, I know, Jerry, when we talked last week about this, uh, you said, well, it wasn't something that you really wanted to take forward, but uh, maybe there would be people in OGM who want to take this forward. And uh, I'm certainly interested enough in generative commons uh, as a whole in, in and, and certainly how, how it could work or should work or, or, or how we, would like to have it work or that I could have a play a role in that if there were other people who'd like to, to help with me. And this whole idea of the, the directory or, or whatever you want to call it is something that's not difficult to set up. Uh, I mean, we could set up something on Mattermost and send out a message and people could just log in and, and say what kind of skill sets they had to offer. And I mean, you wouldn't have to talk about things that you didn't want to offer to anyone, but uh, yeah, who, know, who know? I mean, I'm a great believer in that famous uh, six degrees of separation. And I once worked out that I was three degrees of separation from Barack Obama at that time. And who knows who somebody in this call is, is three degrees away from. So yeah, that, that's my thought at the moment. Let's, let's t each think about what we heard that's worth 
worth doing and uh, and in a sort of selfish way because you want it and in a uh, in a uh, commons way because it's good for the commons and let's see what we want to do. Um, thanks Hank. Uh, a brief side note, I'm two degrees from Kevin Bacon because I went to Penn and his dad was Ed Bacon, who was a professor of uh, ar uh, architecture and urban planning, actually, mostly urban planning. And so I took history and theory of urban design from Ed Bacon at Penn because one of the, one of the features of Wharton was that you could just take courses in any of the grad schools at Penn you wanted to. And I was an econ undergrad, which meant I didn't have to take micro, macro, blah, blah, blah. So I got, I got some, a little bit of room in my schedule. And so, so I basically took a course from Ed Bacon, really brief story, uh, who was awesome. He was like 74 at the time, tall, virile. He would use sexual metaphor in class and mean it. Uh, and he, he gave us uh, three tours of Philadelphia. Uh, one tour we all met at the corner of Independence Mall, Ninth and Race. Uh, he had us all blindfolded and then put us in, in line. So we held the, the shoulder of the person ahead of us. And then he led that line down through the square and all of a sudden we heard a shout and he walked us through a couple of fountains that were only like calf deep, but he had told us to wear like old sneakers. But, but he, he, the experience of being blindfolded in the square and hearing the water echo was really interesting. And then, so he walked us through the fountains. Then he had us take off the blindfolds and he sent us off in 90 second intervals. And he had marked a path across Philadelphia over to, to Newmarket with uh, like flower on the sidewalk. And you, would, you were to follow that not say a word, you were not allowed to take notes, but you had to register what, what your impressions were. And he had spent, he was, he'd been the city planner of Philadelphia for 50 years and had done a bunch of things called greenways where there were alleys, there were, you, you could get from Independence Mall to Newmarket pretty much never walking along a street on a normal sidewalk because there were all these interesting little alleys and parks and, and things chained together. And that's what the tour was anyway. Um, I have some really great stories about Ed Bacon. So I have two degrees from Kevin. I never got to meet Kevin, but I'm, I got to meet his mom too. She came along on, on those tours. <laughs> um, long digression, sorry about that. Uh, anybody else? Um, have a great day, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Judy. Thanks for, for being here. And we're yeah, gonna wrap Judy, pretty soon. Judy, we're getting... The thing that you're, the, the Piragi, Pira, uh, Piragachi. Piragachi thing you're doing, is that um, uh, only accessible by YouTube? Or no, it's um, if you just go into Piragaji. Oh, I should figure out where the link is and <laughs> paste it in the chat. If you can drop it in, that'd be awesome. Put it back in the mattermost, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I, if I remember, the calls have audience. It's a Zoom call with audience, and then they post it online later. Right. Yeah, I just saw they a YouTube have, link from. Often I'm told by Charlotte, fairly small, but they record it, and then it's available on Piragaji. Right. Yeah, I did, I did one with them, which was really fun. Um, so you guys are all now three degrees of Kevin Bacon, by the way, because you know me, so. I was just posting, we are everyone we know, everyone they know, and everyone they know are within six degrees of Kevin Bacon now. So, yeah, yeah. You know, you really, wow. Just trying to make the world a smaller place. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I like this path of inquiry. It feels to me like it complexifies our quest to do a generative commons thing, but in a really fruitful way. Um, so a couple questions for the group. How do we phrase this quest so that it's sort of like, so that we're describing the path we're exploring well so that it attracts other people into the conversation. Uh, let's try to invite other people into the conversation. I know that uh, Matt Saia and Jordan Sukut were really, really interested in the generative commons and did some work on it a couple weeks ago. And then Matt got super busy. Last week, he produced an event for one of his clients that was a pretty major thing. So he, his whole world was eaten up by that. So I think he can, I think he's emerged from that. We can maybe breathe in and rejoin the conversation. We'll see. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll ping and see if he's up for, for rejoining and Jordan too. But, but we had made a list of other people that might be interested here. I think we can do that. But with this new path of inquiry, I think what that does is it opens up a bunch of maybe new people to, to bring in. Um, any, any other sort of concluding thoughts? Well, I, I would say that, that um, it's, it's an, 
you know, I think I think it puts some pressure for I don't know if pressure is a great word, but but uh, puts a point on the need to um, delineate delineate OGM's um, purpose and structure in terms of the commons, in terms of those who want to participate in the commons. And, you know, I mean, all, all of what Vincent's saying, I just think is, is spot on. It's just, you know, their, their, their experiences and connections, you know, certainly that the people in this room have, um, but, you know, it, it's easier to deal with when they're not typically monetized and um, when they are, and they've been literally spent on either in terms of time or money in a clear way or will be, um, we need to figure out how, how we, how we transact, you know, and, and um, how we, how we are, are safe in transacting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's good stuff. It's fun. It's fun. This is like a monster quest. So, hey, I'm, I'm up for it. I'm uh, still trying to figure out how to make this work, but uh, kind of so are we all, right? <clears throat> um, any other wrapping thoughts for today's call? Stacy, does this put you any place different, interesting? No, it puts me exactly. I'm just sitting here saying, how do I explain what I want to be able to explain? No, this I, I will ask a question, a philosophical Please. question. Okay? Oh God, oh God, we hate those. <laughs> Go ahead. Just something to think about. I don't expect yeah. an answer, but one of the things that I've always thought about is, and again, I'm from the States and that's where I'm focused. What would our country look like if we offered a choice? One, you pay taxes and everything is included. Absolutely everything. The other, you don't pay taxes, but if you wanna purchase services, from the all-inclusive section, then you pay for it. And you know, this way it like provides two tracks. And my feeling is the same way sometimes you'll go to a restaurant and you get the choice between all you can eat or a la carte. My feeling is if it were done the right way, people would choose to do the all-inclusive. But again, it still leaves room for different ways of doing things. So I'll just leave that question there. It's the best I can do. Um, I like that. I mean, I, I, somebody who knows public policy would probably say, gosh, that's impossible because you can't, you have to have everybody in to do something, the scale of building all the systems out, uh, but maybe not. And I don't know. And, and, and I think part of what I, <clears throat> part of what I love about being alive at this moment is that a lot of the underlying dynamics and assumptions are changing. <clears throat> a lot of the, a lot of the stuff we take for granted, whether it's the economics of energy uh, whether it's people's ability to live in one place and stay there, except climate change and fires and drought, uh, whether it's like the, there's a, you know, the future of work and jobs, these things are all in flux, as April would say. <clears throat> and and I, I'm hoping that the things that we're working on and trying to figure out will actually build a platform and some processes and some norms and some means and some intentions for how to do really well in that world. Um, more thing please i see ogm as the commons that allows people to either be part of that inclusivity or to come in and purchase services so providing two ways to participate so maybe we need like an ogm vending machine i like it i mean that's interesting i, I feel like the 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 notion of um you know uh, pay your taxes and and get what you need back essentially, which is is like is is the unif is the universal healthcare um, model, and it's also the subscription platform model, um, and versus you know micro payments for services or take what's given to you because you're, um, you're submitting to capitalist, um, you know, surveillance capitalism and advertising is gonna pay for it. Um, 
that that is is sort of an essential question, Stacy. I mean, I just think you're really right with that. And the the challenge is in the sort of cooperative that you're imagining people being able to opt into um, everybody is whether literally paying taxes or or contributing to the the common good with their skills and services or both um, they have to pay in and put in to get back um, or be left alone in the sort of freelance pay as you go world. I, I mean, it's a, it's a huge question. It's like, it has just ramifications everywhere. Stacey, go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, <laughs> I want to hear what more. I, what I envisioned as a bigger framework was almost like a social experiment which tied into the video creation we were talking about and it all tied in together. Um, so, and the other thing is, who was it that said it yesterday? Scott was talking about breaking tasks into smaller pieces. And I thought that was critical because that allows somebody to stop in, work for an hour, still be part of something. And there's just so many things that could, you know, I just think it could bring in academics that want to study the pro like I to me the biggest part of what I was talking about with the show was not the goal of creating the videos but it's how we set it up and what actually happens with us mm -hmm. creating it and having a team that says well wait let's bring in people to measure how many jobs are created let's look at all these different tools because people can pick and choose their tools that gives the people creating tools a platform as well. That could tie into where we could get money for people that are willing, you know, the bigger, you know, more successful tech people. And I know nothing about this, but that gives them incentive to want to fund us. So it's, it's a really big kind of picture, but all these things can be fit in if we, you know, do it right and leave two, at least two tracks because mm -hmm. we have, two different mindsets and trust is a big factor. And so I'm in the middle of trying to explain OGM to potential funders. So this is a really valuable conversation. Um, and then and then, not to dull the, the two track part of it, but I have a belief in my head that, that I got from reading Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, which is one of my favorite books. And one of the things he says is that market economy requires market society. So once we got industrialism and once people were sort of torn off the land and turned into free labor, which was a big change, people were mostly tied to where they, where they were born. Almost nobody traveled more than three miles from where they were born, uh, except for the military, the clergy, and you know, traveling salesmen kind of thing, the tax collectors. Um, but once, once we sort of changed all that, suddenly everything had a price and cap, market economy, capitalism can't have a whole bunch of people living over there happily with a different regime over their land, with everything else. It kind of needs everybody to be in the pool and all the land to be available for purchase. So it resists, it creates laws that say you can't do that, you can't do that. You know, it illegalizes other ways of being. And the, the, the natural metaphor or analogy I use is, uh, I ask people, do you know how cuckoos raise their young? Cuckoo birds. And it turns out that cuckoo birds don't raise their young. Cuckoo birds are brood parasites. They lay their eggs in other birds' nests, like a robin. And then the other birds like, are like, geez, what's like, one of these kids is bigger than the other ones. And the first instinct of a cuckoo chick is to shove everything outside the nest. It's horrible. So a cuckoo chick is born hatched in the robin's nest. And the first thing it does is it backs up against everything else in the nest and shoves it out of the nest. So the other robin eggs go to the ground, other robin chicks go to the ground, whatever. And then the robins come back and raise the cuckoo and on, you know, on we go. Capitalism is like a cuckoo. It, it's, it's parasitic on other, other forms of existence and tries to sort of suck them dry. And I think what we're talking about here is antidotes to that. It's like, how do, how do we break that? And I like uh, Cory Doctorow's book, Walk Away is an interesting thought experiment and one way to do that, just to sort of walk away from the traditional economy and to, to instantiate a new way of doing things. And he, 
he has a world in which you know 3D fabrication and a few other things are easily available. So you can actually go out into the desert, create abundance and build yourself a village. And the village can be better than your last village was because you saved the plans in the cloud and you can make things out of most anything and you've made improvements in all of your plans and your governance mechanisms are sort of perpetual and always improving as well. Sort of interesting that way. Anyway. Burning Man. One more, one more thing. Yeah. yeah, Burning Man. Go ahead, Stacey. Um, so once somebody's basic needs are met, what, what rivals more money? To me, what you're doing with your time if you're feeling fulfilled and creative and happy. So I try to look sometimes at attention and replace attention with, uh, with uh, money. Um, I forgot where I was going with this, but there was some place. Well, and also connection and a sense of meaning. Like you said, you said what, what happens when somebody's basic needs are met? Yes. So again, the, the idea, I always feel like if you, if you create the best party, people will choose to come to yours. And so that's, anyway. <laughs> totally agree. Totally agree. Um, we are over time here. Um, this has been really useful. Thank you all. Uh, Michael, I want to figure out how to like put wheels under your question um, and make it more powerful. Let's, let's at least sort of focus there next week in this call. And then let's figure out, because this, this touches like why we're here and what OGM does, you know, in, in really important ways. And I need to find a way to articulate it well. Uh, so it's an important quest. All right. <laughs> yeah, I think we should timestamp that. Yeah, the piece when Michael started talking, that was probably a good timestamp for a wrap potentially. <laughs> I will, when I, when I upload the, the video, I will find the, the moment when he's, when he started wrapping. Cool. Uh, great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, will we have another call same time next week? Yes, this is a standing call at this point. Perfect. See cool. you all then. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.